listening to Parent Projects. Hey, everybody. A, a diagnosis of dementia and Alzheimer's disease doesn't mean that you have to give up on everything or anyone really that you love. Those of you that really like to travel and are looking for a way to do it, but it's freaking you out and how people are going to respond to the situation or how even you're going to respond to the situation. You're going to find a lot in today's conversation with Jan Dari. Uh, Jan is an expert in traveling with dementia, and I am confident that you can leave this episode today feeling capable of doing one of the most important things you can, which is giving a gift of travel to your loved one with memory problems. Stay tuned for traveling well with dementia. You're listening to Parent Projects, a family media and technology group production. Now here's your host, Tony Siebers. Well, hey, today we've got Jan Doherty on and uh, wow, her blessing into lives like mine, which is uh, families that have to come together for the holidays, maybe from multiple areas of the country and are facing travel, whether you're taking a ship, you're taking a train, or you're taking an airplane. Uh, it, she really brings a lot of comfort into that situation, setting those for real expectations, giving some pointers and some things you can share with your family ahead of time so that they understand how, um, how to take in everything that's out there and everyone can make the most of the situation so it can unfold a beautiful experience, uh, for your loved one. Jan, uh, thanks for joining us today. It is a blessing to have you and your talents on. Thank you so much. That's well, good to join you today. And Jen, so you 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 you've got a, a tremendous book out here that has an amazing amount of checklists uh, from everything from understanding um, how to find respite care and somebody to help you when you just you've had enough, it's too difficult to come up. How to think about uh, somebody helping you engage with this, things to think about when you get there. What 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 experience led you to being an expert? in traveling with somebody in such a, a difficult condition like this? Well, I think it combined a couple loves I have. So, you know, I've been a, a nurse for many, many years, and I specialized in the care of people living with dementia and their families. And um, through that experience, and particularly working with people with a new uh, dementia diagnosis, when we would talk to them about what's important to you in the next year or two, frequently we heard people say, you know, I, I just, I want to take that, dr that dream trip that I've always been thinking about. I want to uh, make sure that I stay connected to my adult children who live in another state. And um, so that really resonated with me because I love to travel as well. And thinking ahead about the number of baby boomers who will be affected by Alzheimer's disease or related to, you know, it's, it's expected that by 2050, some 14 to 16 million people in the U.S., about 50 million people worldwide are going to be living with a dementia and um, staying connected to the people and the places that we love, I think, is imperative when living with a chronic condition like Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, without a doubt. And the value of, um, of, of, of fighting and defeating isolation, which is something that just tends to set in on that family member. Uh, I, I think is huge in travel. You know, when you're when you first start looking at a trip, um, and you you started looking at this, you spend some time with with other industry experts, right? So you're like me. You've you've had family experiences and other things. I know that prepare you for this, but you've got a whole other step. Uh, you, I mean, you've worked with cruise industry, you've worked with the airline industry in order to understand those things. What what how how did you even come about doing those things, or how how did those how do those relationships and how are they finding you, and how how does that work? Well, I think it, it, you know, one is, as I um, began to pursue writing a book, again, my goal was how do I help families stay connected, right, in a, mm -hmm. in a disease that is wrought with a lot of challenges, but a lot of myths and stigma. And so it was really beginning to debunk that. And, and as I began to look at the airlines and look at hotels and look at cruise lines, um, in, the, in the term that's used accessibility, 
um, accessibility for them was all about people with physical disabilities, people using wheelchairs, people who needed oxygen. And it didn't include people who had cognitive disorders with the exception of uh, looking at children living with autism. So I'm really delighted that the travel industry has really begun to embrace um, you know, that uh, condition, which is a family condition, much like Alzheimer's disease is. And yeah. so it became very apparent that um, accessibility needed to expand and really look at a, a number of people who are living with cognitive disabilities. Certainly autism is one, but there are you know, a lot of mental health disabilities. There are people living with PTSD and then, you know, some 6.2 million Americans living with a dementia like Alzheimer's. And so it's really been one of exploration and one of becoming educated and then trying to advocate and educate uh, an industry that often hasn't thought about people living with dementia traveling. And well, so and it's been an experience. Well, and there are increasing numbers as you, I mean, you just pointed to as that comes up, we're seeing a, a much that that silver tsunami that rapidly aging uh, group of people that need to, some of them need to figure it out. And, and there's not as many family members uh, uh, to, to be able to escort or walk them through or caregivers. So it's, do you find that the, that the travel industry in general is, is really open and they're, they're moving in a, in real positive directions for this in general? So I think it were early in, in the process. I would love to say they're embracing this, but remember they too represent uh, a public who doesn't understand dementia who is working with very old information, who often think that people with dementia become violent, that everybody's mm -hmm. living in a nursing home. And so part is educating uh, um, these individuals too, that no, these are walking, talking, very vibrant, very able individuals for many years after a diagnosis. And so um, there's a lot of stigma in the industry, you know, because nobody wants to be known as the dementia cruise line, the dementia, right, airline, because really, you know, we're a youth oriented, um, very sexy, glamorous, especially when we think about travel, right? I get yeah. uh, travel magazines. And first of all, if you see somebody with gray hair, um, they, they're, they're gorgeous and they've been, you know, airbrushed. They don't show older adults to, typically in travel. And again, when we see images, even on TV, and they show a person living with dementia, they show somebody who is lifeless, who seems to yeah. have no joy, no hope you know, uh, scrunched over. And so, you know, that's the, the stigma that exists right now in our culture. And we've got to change that to help people understand that that's, you know, yes, dementia. And I don't want to candy coat a condition that is progressive and, and right, uh, right. <clears throat> kinds of situations. But, you know, um, there are a good three to five years that people can live with dementia and travel and yeah. do it with support and be successful. And that's, I think, what we need to continue to educate our travel industry, right? That we want to partner with you. We want you to be successful because they do want to create a good customer experience for the person who's right. traveling. Right. And, and, and that increasing numbers of, of, or this increasing success that we're seeing with bat, even or attention in the battling with dementia, the battle against Alzheimer's, you're seeing new medications or other solutions that might come on that can, that can slow it or that progression means you could have people living in that condition of being able to travel for much, a prolonged period of time, a much longer period of time in, in living with the diseases, the disease works at them. So that great, really well. Um, I'm glad to know I'm glad to know that there's somebody in the industry that's that's got our backs, that's going up, who's at least opened the door as early as it may be, who's opened the door for those conversations. And I would imagine continuing to support you and anything we can do to help bring awareness to those those industries as well will will be fantastic. Um, I, yeah, I appreciate that work. And Thank and you. I'm going I'm going to uh, we're going to take just a moment here to to take a knee and, and talk about kind of those 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 good works. Uh, we're going to pitch out and, and give a moment to highlight the Mana House out here in Phoenix, Arizona, and an ability to, to continue helping them through that transition of what they work as well. Hey guys, uh, this is Tony at the Parent Projects Podcast. And if you are powered by coffee the way that I'm powered by coffee, I think you'll appreciate knowing a way that you can help the last, lost, and least of us that didn't have a great transition. 
You see, the Refuge Coffee Company is a social enterprise operated by Catholic Charities of Central and Northern Arizona, where they use this coffee and this business model to help homeless veterans at the Manor House Transitional Community get back on their feet. Help a veteran turn a handout into a hand up by giving them the opportunity to earn your business. Purchase coffee today at therefugeaz.com. That's the Refuge az.com. If you order six or more bags, shipping will be free. And if you tell them that Parent Project sent you, I'm going to send you a travel coffee mug. Thank you again, and let's get back to the show. Hey guys, this week here with Jan Doherty and her book, Traveling Well with Dementia, is a great resource for those of you that might be traveling this holiday season or other holiday or any time of year, honestly. Uh, and you've got a loved one uh, that you maybe caretake or you're just preparing for a family member to come in uh, during the holiday season or during some other time and need to get a baseline of what's going through and how to plan as a family. So, uh, Jan, again, you know, I obviously we just went over, you've, you've got a great background for this. You're connected not only in at the family side, but you've got a great visibility in what's happening in the trends in the industry and what can be done professionally to make, you know, to set reasonable expectations. Let's, um, let's, let's talk about that. Some reasonable expectations, you know, chapter, a couple of chapters in your book, one of them talks about why you might want to consider not making a trip in the first place. I mean, you're really, you're really clear to go look at that. I think it's in chapter five. Um, but you've also got other chapters that just talk through, hey, these are some of the easy things. In addition to planning ahead, which is kind of a main theme I see across the whole book, these are some of these things that you can do that start knocking down the difficulty. We don't, we don't have to make it harder on ourselves. But what are those, what are those key things? If you, you've got a family that's dreading this, dread, what are those first couple of things that you place on them to, to open the door, but you know, the, the travel's a real thing for them and can't happen. Yeah, I think, you know, whether mm. whether um, we're traveling there, they're traveling here, again, this idea of how do we all try to align ourselves and understand the situation for which it is, you know, what what is this person who's living with dementia like now? And, and how is it that we all work together to support this to be a really good experience what's that going to look like and so we have to have some open and honest conversations and this can be very difficult for family members who live at a distance they only talk to the person on the phone they think they sound fine but the reality is is very different than that and so we have to be transparent about here's what's happening in this current situation this is this is what's dad is living with like right now and i'm so glad that when he gets on the phone with you he's really engaged and he's asking you questions but what you need to know is most of the time here he's pacing around the house he's you know he's very confused he gets extremely anxious when i leave the house and so here's uh, what you need to know as you come to visit us this is what's going to help dad have a great visit and will really help me to support you all to be um, enjoying our time together, right? And so we have to be open and honest and very clear with that. Um, and, and that often is very difficult, especially for married couples, um, you know, who want to say, well, it's, it's not the kid's problem. Well, well, it is. <laughs> you know, I say Alzheimer's disease is a family condition. And, you know, if mom drops over dead. Guess what? Um, I, as the adult daughter or son, I'm on deck, right, to come right. in. And so I need to know what the situation is. Right. And if you found ways that are helpful to be um, relate to dad, boy, wouldn't it be nice for me to know? And, you know, and for our children to know, because again, this is a family condition and without good knowledge, everybody's, uh, assuming certain things that can be completely wrong. And, uh, again, you know, that was my real goal writing this book is that, um, families find success that care partners don't feel alone in this and that the person living with dementia can find joy in, in these moments of being together with the people that they love most. 
So as a family member, uh, if let's say that my my a lot of times we're we're still seeing mom is a caretaker for dad or dad's a caretaker for mom that's starting to experience this. So let, let's let's throw that one forward that maybe that's what we're we're experiencing here. Uh, so as a family that's waiting for everybody to come down over here, engaging in some of those conversations with mom about dad or with dad about mom and what works well and what doesn't work well and what to expect. I, the day of travel. It described to me maybe kind of a, a more ideal day of travel for uh, dad with dementia as mom and dad are flying in. What should I set for as a family member? How can I prepare my house and what should I be thinking about as I'm getting ready for everybody to come in for the holiday? Yeah, great, great <laughs> question. So one is uh, just as basic as where um, are we going to stay? when we arrive um you'd like us to stay with you but the reality is boy there's a lot of commotion at your house and you know um dad doesn't really do well with a lot of commotion so by the way i i booked uh you know a hotel nearby and um you know he's kind of slow going in the morning and so i know you'd like us to be there for christmas breakfast but you know eight o'clock it's it's just not going to happen because sometimes dad is up uh, during the night. So, you know, probably 11 o'clock would be more realistic for us to come to your, your house. And um, by the way, um, we're probably going to go back to the hotel after we have breakfast because uh, what I've found is dad's going to need some quiet time. So again, we really start laying out specifically, here's what it's going to be. And by the yeah. way, when dad um, yells out or or um, uses foul language, which will probably take you by surprise because dad's never done that, it probably says he's tired, he's had enough, or he's feeling frustrated. So don't, don't reprimand him. Don't say, dad, you shouldn't talk like that. Rather, you know, try to switch the subject or find some humor, right, to yeah. help dad diffuse. But um, this is what's going to help us have a great vacation with you. We're, we can hardly wait to see you. We love you. Um, and, and so, you know, ending with positive, you know, kind of a positive, we're glad to come, but here's what you need to know, which is going to be different and maybe disruptive from the plans you have to, but boy, are we excited. And those are, so that gives me the great questions to be asking mom about dad as we're prepping for those types of things. Uh, what I like, uh, what I also like in there to think through is, hey, look, I, I might not know, I've heard you talk on this before, uh, I might know, not know what to do with sundowning right? And where mm -hmm. all those are. Mm -hmm. But I know what to do with a fatigue child, right? I understand mm -hmm. that. And so using it, kind of calling it to that, moving away mm -hmm. from the the niche conversation or, or, or words that are used into something that's, you know, like you explained, dad starts using language like this. He starts working through these things. When we come off the plane, we're going to be tired. It's not the best time for us to have everybody over there to welcome us as we're coming through, um, you know, mm -hmm. setting something up at eight o'clock at night or seven thirty at night, it's not going to get the best version of dad. Generally, if we've got something that's got to happen there, uh, we're going to need a slow day kind of leading our way up to that. Mm -hmm. Those, and it just like you would in, in having that explainer thinking about that, the way that I would deal with a, with a young person that just right. was tired, just was fatigued because right. that, because that happens. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that's a great way to put it, Tony. Remember when the kids were little and uh, how we adjusted, you know, even when we'd go to church and and what time we would gather for Christmas Eve, because we knew that they were excited for Santa to come and that we needed to get them home and in bed because they'd be up earlier than normal. Right. Right. Remember those times? Well, now we're kind of doing similar things. Not that dad's a child. That's really important to point out because we don't want to make the challenge. Uh, right. Right. That, right. That's now a, a kid again, but rather, you know, these are the adjustments we make as a family because just like we wanted the kids to experience joy on Christmas morning, hey, we want that for dad, but now Christmas morning for him is going to be best around 11 a.m. Yeah, and I know, that's, and I know that's a, a it's a change, but again, we love you. We're so happy to be with you, um, and thank you for making that change for us. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a great for, again, for me as the family member pulling that conversation out in case mom's not ready to have that conversation, mm -hmm. knowing what I'm going to ask as I make through those and, and thinking about that same way that I made adjustments when I got a little kiddo, it's not feeling well or working through something and they are not the same thing. I, you know, I've heard, uh, what the, one of the, the clearest way, it, obviously dementia is so different in so many different, you know, facets from that, but one of the easiest ways to understand, 
uh, that I've heard explained uh, quickly was that, you know, think of if if your executive thought process, your your ability to think of something you want to do and work from that thing works really well. But your ability to take in and respond and then remember what has to happen and to even remember where you are at to formulate a plan of where things have to happen because you're not picking up on on those markers of, oh, I've walked out this door, I'm now in this room, or I'm more, or I've, I've passed this street, so if I get lost after something happens that I'm, that I'm generally in this direction, those are the things that have slipped the most. And so it's any of those situations that are generally that are putting them on the spot to have to process information and then work that back through, and it's not their idea to drive, it's going to take more energy than one in which they get to drive. And so we'll try to set them up for success where they're able to drive as much as possible and show us what makes them happy. And uh, and I can I can relate to that as a family that's here dealing with that and receiving a family member um, working through that, you know, cognitive impairment or whatever else I could I could work through that. So that's But you know, Tony, it also makes me think that on the other hand, if you're working with your family and they're not they're not receptive. They're saying, oh, you're making too much of this. You're, ju- you're just blowing everything out of proportion. You're making dad sound worse than what he is. Then that also might be a signal on, is this going to be in my best interest that we visit? Is right? this going to so be in I'm, his best interest that you're going well, to Well, yeah, because, you know, we're putting her under rapid fire and, it, it, you know, she already knows it's going to be a disaster for him. And now she's going to have to accompany somebody who's really upset and agitated because we had family who really didn't want to accept, you know, the reality of what was going on. So, you know, a lot of what I talk about in my book is, you know, when shouldn't you go? And sometimes it really is the person, you know, perhaps they're they're um, they're too confused now, even at home and taking them out of the comfort and safety of home into a new environment. is just going to really press them. But on the other hand, if you as a caregiver or family really aren't open to adjusting, to accepting the help and the advice, if you're not willing to flex, those two become markers of maybe this isn't a good time for you to visit. Yeah. Right. Maybe we just need it. It'd be better if we set up a Zoom call. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, and, the day, well, right? and, and that 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 might be more true in a holiday period than others, because there's a lot of expectations of a holiday period, more so than than uh, maybe even traveling for a wedding or traveling for something else where there's this other focal point of attention. But but the truth is, during that holiday sessions that where this person who's traveling, this loved one is probably at some point in time going to be a focal part, a uh, focal mm-hmm. point of what's going on. And and that can be a lot to work in. So, you know, this is great. I want, I want to take a break here real quick. You know, family communication, obviously it's huge. It's everything, uh, you know, to our listeners and, and our members out there. If you haven't been, been circled back around at parentprojects.com, if you haven't looked through to get on Parent Projects Connect, which is our new web app that helps families communicate, start talking about these things to understand what are the general tasks that the experts recommend that you knock out or make a part of your parent project when their problem becomes a project for you to be working on, uh, to a place to connect with, say, vendors and experts like Jan uh, when you're working your way through these problems. Uh, please make sure you come over to that. And we're going to take a quick break here just to get a, a, a peek at that product. And we'll be back in one sec. Hey guys, welcome back. We've got Jan Doherty, the Travel Well with Dementia author. I've got the book. Uh, you should get the book. Uh, by the way, this is uh, this is available. You can you can get this um, in ebook. You can get this in standard. I think Amazon's probably the quickest and the easiest way to uh, for someone to to pick the book up for us. Uh, Jan, we've been talking through um, these essential tips to enjoy the journeys. And that's, that's, that's obviously what we're hoping someone's going to be able to find out. We've talked about some reason you might want to think about now is not the time uh, to make that trip, but let's say now is when you're going to go and you're going to work through it. You start working your way through, you're working through the checklist. You've thought through, how do I deal with 
continents issues ahead of time, right? What are the what are the trips and just, what is that bathroom really going to mean to us? What are the the fact that I don't like to use a travel agent, but that a travel agent has access to accessibility uh, features and resources and things that they can book in a booking very different than what I can get if I just go up there and try to work. In fact, even trying to find it on the website for one of the major airlines, it's really hard to find those accessibility things. So there's some things that we you, you really could buy in to make this a lot easier for yourself. Jan, I guess a question I want to start handling as, as we start landing the plane here proverbially is, let's say you go in for this, you do this, and things start trending in a difficult direction, some of those big pitfalls, what are those, what are, what, where do you pull that out? Where, where do you park the car? Like what, what are the things to be thinking about if you, you make this trip, you come into this trip and you start getting yourself into trouble? What are some of the most common things you'll see? And what are your recommendations against that? Well, yeah, first of all, you know, if people have not traveled for a while. I'm a big fan of people taking a staycation, right? That let's mm-hmm. try three days kind of in our community at home. Let's see how we do when we stay in an unfamiliar place, right? A hotel or maybe an Airbnb, whatever that might be. Let's see how we do when we start eating out two meals a day. When we go, you know, visit the zoo or we take in a movie or we just go take a stroll, you know, how is the person doing so that we have a preview, first of all, of how will this work and how are they going to perform? So when things start running amok, the first thing to do is stop. (laughs) <laughs> like, okay, so we need to just, uh, we just need to quiet things down. So it could be in that moment, let's say we're, we're at a family gathering and, and grandma's getting all upset and she's calling the kids a brat. She's yelling. She's really upset. The first thing I would do, I wouldn't be trying to put her in a car. I would be getting her into a quieter room in the house. And, um, you know, mom, let's, let's just go into the other room. Boy, I don't know about you, but it's just really noisy out there for me. So one, I want to validate that you're feeling upset. I see that. And I see that too. Let's, let's just kind of go into this other room. So we, first of all, calm mom down and then, and then suggest, you know, why don't we just go back to the hotel? Or maybe it means we need to say to the family, if they're at our house, they're coming here, that we say, you know what, um, I think the evening needs to end. Um, you know, I've had families that are on a trip and um, and they see this growing confusion and angst, so their person isn't comfortable, whatever that looks like for them. And they've gotten on the phone in the middle of the night and called the airlines and said, you know what, we're, we're taking out the first uh, midday flight, we can get out tomorrow. So we also have to be willing to say, when does this trip need to end um, and, and do it in a safe way. Uh, manner. And that Mm -hmm. becomes really important. But I think uh, one then is coming back and and not saying, oh, this was this was like an epic fail, but rather (laughs) evaluating kind of what happened when the course changed. So how do we correct this next time? So it could be that what was happening, you know, I've had families that have done road trips. And on the way there, um, you know, the wife was was quite uh, conjoled and happy to be making this road trip because they once loved to do it. But boy, then they hit uh, the place that they were visiting and every day was just, you know, lunch with these people and dinner with these people and let's go here and let's go there so that by three, four days into that trip, you know, the wife who is normally really delightful now is crabby and she's striking out, right? And verbally when she's just saying, I'm overwhelmed. So next year, let's not do a road trip. Let's plan to do, you know, an airline and let's get there and let's stay with one person and let's just maybe have one visit a day, right? So yeah. it's not that it has to end. Rather, this is where we look at the whole of it and think, when did things start going south? And then what could I do that could reverse that, right? So the principles of how do I uh, incorporate the daily routine every day, whether we're traveling or people are coming to see us? How do I ensure that my my loved one is getting enough rest throughout the day during these visits? How do I make sure that I'm not overwhelming them with just too much, too much noise, too many people, too many activities, you know? And, and how do I prepare 
the others around me to what I call be dementia capable. They're dementia friendly. They know how to interact with her. They know how to keep her comfortable. They know how to include her. And yeah. when I start doing all of those things, we're much like less likely to see, um, you know, a lot of the challenges arise during travel. Well, and, and one thing that comes to mind, many things come to mind off of that. Uh, but one in particular is it probably is pretty important to leave a little gas in the tank, uh, understanding that there's going to have to be travel home. If things start trending in one particular direction, and you weren't expecting that, you may need to hedge and just immediately start thinking, okay, well, we the close off's gonna take energy whenever that is. And we're gonna have to maybe bring the energy down to to prep up and make that last surge to get home in a in a in a reasonable manner as well. Is there is there any tips to that or, or any things to think about there? Again, you know, as we think about traveling home, traveling home during the best time of the day, right? So not thinking that we have to be up at the crack of dawn to catch the first flight out or hit the road. No, no 5 a.m. flights out. Right? Yeah. No, no 5 a.m. flights yeah. out just because the air yeah. was better. But noon, um, you know, allows us to get comfortably to the airport by 10, making sure we get to the airport, you know, making sure that we're using accessibility at the airport, um, that we maybe call TSA care right? It, uh, many people don't understand that TSA provides uh, passenger support in many of the larger airports where they can help you and your loved one get through security. Yes, you still have to go through security. You don't get out of it. Uh, but that could be helpful. It's helpful thinking that when I go home, I've called my neighbor and said, hey, can you make sure we've got a carton of milk in the house and some English muffins so that tomorrow morning we can have breakfast when we get home, um, knowing that um, this is another big one, that when you get home, that as you've been gone for a week or 10 days, you're exhausted, your loved one is exhausted, you shouldn't be booking doctor's appointments or any anything else, you know, that right now is the time for us to hunker down, expect that your person might be more confused for several days and maybe even up to a week. And um, it's really important that you just do what you can do to kind of create a calm atmosphere, get back into your rhythm again, get plenty of rest and let people help you as you return. Right, right. Those are, so as you were, um, you touched in there on TSA Cares, which we, we just were, th were throwing up across mm -hmm. the screen. We'll throw that up here in just one second. Um, the TSA Cares, what, what, Talk to me about that. What what is uh, what is that going to do for us? Well, what it's going to do is allow you to have the added support you need. So, oftentimes, I would say to people that I work with in our clinic, you know, why don't you get your loved one with dementia into a wheelchair? But let's say you you've got a husband who just says, "I'm not getting into a wheelchair. I don't need a wheelchair." Well, a passenger support specialist could join you and walk with you and your husband so that you stay together through the security process. They really try to uh, help it to be a calm experience. And maybe they'll even yeah. stay with you until you board the plane. So uh, they do a variety of things, helping a variety of people with medical and accessibility issues. But it really can help just knowing that you've got someone else who can help you uh, make it through the security process, by which is, by the way, the most stressful part of airline travel is going through security. So it gives you that added support so you don't feel rushed and flustered uh, when you're going through that experience. So that's really helpful to know. The other is there's a program called the Sunflower Lanyard Program that mm -hmm. now 62 airports across the U.S. are embracing. So it's, it's through an organization called Hidden Disabilities, but through that you can purchase uh, you know, a, a lanyard that is, is green and it's got daisies on it, or through your participating airport, you can get it for free. And airport employees are being taught, as well as airlines, that when someone is wearing this lanyard that is a person with a hidden disability, right? You can't see dementia. You can't see hearing loss. You can't see visual disturbance, right? But this, this disability lanyard, if you will, lets people know that here's a person who's just going to need more time and patience on my part, whether I'm a vendor working at an airport, let's say that someone comes in and I, and, and they're trying to pay their bill for the, what they're purchasing, their, their, their snacks for the airplane and I see the lanyard, 
um, it lets me know that I'm not going to rush this person, right? So that's another wonderful uh, thing. I think that we're trying to improve knowledge about this hidden disability and these become tools. The other is I would say if you're flying through an airport, 80% of travel will involve an airplane uh, as much as we like or dislike it. Um, I would say go on the website at your local airport and particularly look to see where the family restrooms are because that's something um, we don't want to do is to send um, dad into the men's restroom, right, unaccompanied. Or, um, you know, I see this a lot with um, families where they'll say, will you watch my dad while I run to the bathroom? And so, you know, this good hearted person in the airport says, sure, I'd be happy to watch him, except that dad doesn't know who this person is and says, who are you? And, and walks off and walks away. Yeah. So family yeah. restrooms are a must, right? It's not just for kids, it's for older adults as well. Anybody with a cognitive disability. So knowing where those family restrooms are, knowing where quiet spaces are in the airport, all become really important things. So we have to be prepared for that. You know, and you and I, you're in, you're in uh, Tempe. I'm out here in the East Valley as well. I'm out here in Mesa. Uh, I know our uh, uh, Phoenix Sky Harbor, I think Mesa Airport utilizes the hidden the disabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but isn't it, a, it's a cactus or yeah, something so that's... Phoenix Sky Harbor, which is working to become dementia friendly as well, <clears throat> they have a compassion cacti lanyard. So if you go to the Phoenix Sky Harbor uh, website, and you look for the compassion corner, you yeah. will find the same ability to get the same lanyard, same thing. We're trying to educate uh, City of Phoenix employees and, and the city operates the Phoenix Sky Harbor. Um, we're educating them when they see this lanyard, likewise, this is a person with a hidden disability. Let's slow down, let's, let's show kindness and patience. We should do that to everyone, but we know that travel is stressful for everyone. Uh, that it is. And if you are traveling down here, it's our primary market here in the Phoenix uh, metropolitan area or you're at PHX. I, I believe you find that uh, actually Compassion Corners located down around the uh, the chapel area, if I it recall is, correctly. Yes, in yeah. Terminal 4. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Terminal 4. Great. Well, hey, uh, Jan, boy, you are a wealth of information. We could go on to days and there is absolutely great reason, I think, that we've given uh, for many people to go out there and pick up a copy of the book. It is truly something to have on your shelf if you're a paper person, like like I know we've talked about we are. Uh, if you're looking for that digital version of it, the iBooks are available as well, and you can download those. I highly recommend, I highly recommend this resource. Think about this. Let that planning take place. And Jan, I can't tell you how much we really appreciate it. Thank you for sharing your time, talents, and treasures with us here at Parent Projects. Thanks for having me, and, and happy, safe travels and visits for all. Thank you. Well, that's it for the team this week, and thanks for joining us. If you've enjoyed the content, remember to subscribe and to share this episode on the app that you're using right now. Your reviews and your comments, they really help us expand our reach as well as our perspective. So if you have time, also drop us a note. Let us know how we're doing. For tips and tools to clarify your parent project, simplify communication with your stakeholders, and verify the professionals that you choose, you can find us on YouTube, follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Thanks again for trusting us until our next episode. Behold and be held. Thank you for listening to this Parent Projects podcast production. To access our show notes, resources, or forums, join us on your favorite social media platform or go to parentprojects.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by Family Media and Technology Group Incorporated and Parent Projects LLC. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcast.